Hello everyone, my name is Javier Pinilla. I'm, I'm the senior member in the hematology department at the Etzli Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida, where I really the head of the lymphoma section and director of immunotherapy in this program. And I have the pleasure to have uh, with uh, us today, Arnon Catter for the Amsterdam University. And I'm gonna really uh, allow to introduce himself. So thank you very much, Javier, for the introduction. My name is Arno Kater. I'm a hematologist here in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And I'm also uh, the head, current head of the uh, Hovon CLL study group. Um, and, uh, well, and I'm also uh, leading some of the studies that we will discuss today, including the Aperitimab study. Thank you, Arnon. We're going to really continue to discuss a very interesting presentation that you really brought to us this uh, past uh, December, and the title is the subcutaneous epcoritamab in patient with Richter syndrome, early result from a phase 1b2 trial, EPCOR CLL1. So I guess just for introduction, we are talking about this uh, new therapeutic, immunotherapeutic strategy with bi-specific antibodies, and I'm going to really um, bring Arnon to discuss this very interesting uh, trial. Uh, yeah, Arnon. thank you, Javier. So I think the first thing to discuss a little bit is this whole phenomenon of Richter's transformation. What is it and, and who can get it? Well, Richter's transformation is the development of an aggressive lymphoma in the setting of an underlying chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL, or small lymphocytic lymphoma, uh, SLL. And... Um, it can have different forms. Most commonly, it's a CD20 positive diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is then clonally related. So it's the same tumor with obtained novel mutations uh, uh, to become more aggressive. You also have a smaller group of patients that has a Hodgkin lymphoma as part of a Richter transformation. But today we will discuss for this presentation a CD20 positive DOBCL, which is a known complication of CLL. It, it occurs approximately in two to 10% of the patients, uh, also in the era of novel agents, including BTK and B-cell 2 inhibitors. So it's not solely related to chemotherapy, but poor prognostic factors include prior uh, treatments um, and adverse regenetic mutations or cytogenetics. And the problem currently is that although um, you can treat it with chemotherapy, uh, most of the time you see limited responses with a low median overall survival. So there is really a high unmet medical need for novel treatments in this uh, group of, of diseases. And it's also important to mention that in many trials earlier, those patients were excluded because it's actually very, it's a rare disease and it's not really a normal DOBCL. So patients were excluded from DOBCL trials. And since it's much more aggressive than CLL, normally Richter's transformation is also excluded from CLL trials. So therefore we were very happy in the community that we now had a trial open, a phase one trial where a new drug was open both for CLL patients, but also for patients with Richter's transformation. And the drug under study here is Epcoridumab. Epcoridumab is a novel, kind of a novel uh, um, antibody-based treatment. It's actually not a normal uh, antibody that only binds to one epitope. Normally we know CD20, which is uh, bound by rituximab or obinutuzumab, but this actually has two epitopes that can be recognized. One is a target on the tumor, or one is CD3, the T cell receptor, to bring the T cells close to the tumor. And what you will, what you hope to happen is that the T cell will attack the tumor cells actively because of the proximity that it is then from the tumor cells. Uh, so epcoritumab is a bispecific antibody binds CD20 on the tumors and CD3 on the T cells. Um, and there is already a, a study done, and there are actually many trials done now in, in, in lymphoma, specifically DOBCL, where uh, activity was shown, including one patient with a Richter's transformation. And there is also now a trial still open for patients with CLL. And also in this uh, study, we opened a, a cohort for Richter's transformation. We did already dose findings. So now we at the dose expansion phase. And what I will discuss today is uh, the 10 patients that were included so far. So relatively small number still uh, with um, uh, Richter's transformation uh, as part of a CLL. So if I discuss the 10 patients, these were all patients with uh, uh, high-risk disease of their CLL. So 50% had P53 mutations, 20% had notch mutations, all um, predictors for poor outcome and Richter's transformation. And um, 
uh, if you look to the prior treatment those patients got for their CLL, so some patients, actually uh, three of these 10 patients had Richter transformation as their first symptom of CLL, 70%, so seven patients had already pr prior CLL uh, and, and were treated for that. 70% got chemobinotherapy, and 60% also got targeted agents. And if you look to the uh, treatment they got for their Richter's transformation, 30% uh, had uh, our CHOP, 10% of 10 patients had RDHEP, uh, one patient was in a trial with venetoclax uh, rituximab and EPOC, also chemotherapy-based, and one patient actually had a CAR T-cell therapy before. So if you first look to the side effects we see on this study, uh, patients got a, a, a a complication called CRS, cytokine release syndrome, which is a very well-known side effect of T-cell-based therapies, including CAR T-cells, but also by specific antibodies. So that occurred in uh, nine patients, but it was all grade one and two and no severe cytokine release syndromes were seen. And uh, we saw one patient with clinical tumor lysis, and we didn't see any treatment emergent adverse events that led to discontinuation. If you look to the activity of the of the of the uh, of this agent, I think well, again preliminary but very promising. We saw overall response rates of sixty percent. So six patients got at least a PR, and of those six uh, patients, five of them uh, got a complete metabolic response. Uh, and although, of course, it's a, it's a duration of response, I don't know at the moment because it was really a very early first update on the trial. So I don't know how long those, uh, if it's a limited response or it is a prolonged response. We have seen some patients already doing very good over time. But if we then go to one case of the earlier phase one trial for DOBCL, which included one patient with serious transformation, that patient was a 76-year-old male who was diagnosed with SLL in 2019, got abrutinib, then had a transformation to Richter's one year later, was treated with Archop as a mixed response, so actually progressive disease. And then he got uh, Epcoritumab treatment, and he now already is in his 76th week, and he got a um, complete response very early in his uh, uh, first cycle. And actually, he has now has a remaining complete response and an important thing is that what we saw in this patient, we also see in the other patients, is that it, uh, the time to getting a response is actually very fast. So you know, actually in one or two months, you see uh, the most effects and you see that patient do get a response or not. So you very early on, you see already uh, if, if you have a successful treatment here. Arnold, uh, oh. how often do you, you give the treatment? How often do you give this treatment? Oh, yeah, very good question. Yeah, of course. Uh, so the treatment uh, is, is given. So first you give a... A step up dose, so you give two low dose treatments, um, and then uh, you give it uh, as a, a, a weekly dose uh, in the beginning, um, and and uh, then then it goes lower. So first three three cycles is every week, then it goes to every two weeks from cycle four to nine, and then it goes from every month to from week from week ten onwards. Got it, got it. This is a fascinating uh, trial, I have to say. One of the things that this press impressed me the most when I really was reading the, the trial is the low rate of a CRS, the, what you explained in the, the cytokine uh, reaction syndrome that people with these uh, therapies, uh, including CAR-T, can experience. But in this case, it seemed to me that the administration, the subcutaneous administration was really relatively easy for the patient and really resolved or resulted in a low rate of CRS. Something I believe is quite important considering that patients don't, I guess, won't need to be hospitalized to really get this, this uh, long-term yeah. therapy time. Is that right, Arnold? No, it's very true. And I think there are, when we started the trial and Javier, I'm still not sure what to expect actually. You can, you can, go, you can go two directions. You can say, because you have now a disease, a lymphoma, with a lot of circulating tumor cells as well, CLL cells. Uh, I actually expected, uh, for one, on one hand, a lot of uh, cytokine release problems because you have so many target cells. On the other hand, we know that T cells in CLL are dysfunctional. And as long as CLL cells are present, the T cells don't work very well. So maybe that counterbalances the CRS risk. And actually, I was also positively surprised by the fact that we didn't see a lot of CRS and maybe the reason is indeed that those T cells specifically in the beginning are not that strong. Yeah. So 
in the Hoven group, we're going to take a next step, actually. We're going to combine uh, Venetta clocks first to, to get lower CLL cell numbers and to get better T cells, and then to give a combination for, for uh, CLL uh, to see if you can combine Venetta clocks with Epcoritumab. And That's the phase one study that I just discussed is still open, both for CLL and both for Richter's transformation. So I guess um, uh, you guys are really continue and I'm planning to to really continue with a phase two, I guess, is the plan for this trial or your... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. so first we have you come to finish this phase one B trial, which is those... Uh, 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 escalation, uh, those expansion of, of the same of the same uh, drug level, and uh, I think so far the data look promising enough. I would say, uh, but the company, of course, has to agree to go for uh, the next step, a phase two study. And the big question is: Is this going to be monotherapy, or is this best in combination with either a BTK inhibitor or a or a BCL2 inhibitor? Well, I think it's, it's an, an excellent, um, you know, hope for uh, patients who really, as we see today, start to to need uh, further therapies beyond the PTK and the BCL2, and and we hope to really see that. I think this this um, drug is very well positioned compared maybe with one of the intravenous um, medication that they are being tested with. Seems to me in CLL specifically it may have a higher rate of CRS, which may really, you know, uh, stop the 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 really fast development, but I think I agree. And another thing that I, I'm I'm totally yeah. not sure if that's correct, but I have, but, but I think what you see is that if you target CD20 instead of CD19, it also seems to have improved uh, um, um, side effects, including mostly neurological side effects. It's much less seen, I think, with the CD20 than is CD19 as a target. I agree, and something that we really experienced for sure in the CAR T uh, yeah. era. Neurotoxicity is seen in the C19, so that that's a uh, um, amazing points, and and I think it's uh, once again uh, one of the hopes for for the future treatment besides yeah. CAR in um, biospecifics are gonna really, it's been approved in the United States for follicular lymphoma recently, and, and we really hope to really be further approval. Wow. So it uh, was an excellent uh, kind of review, this abstract, uh, Arnold, uh, really uh, been a pleasure to, to discuss with you, and, and thank you very much for being here today. Very good, thank you so much.